All right. So I was actually reading through the talk description while writing this talk, which in traditional Postgres fashion went right up to the last second. And I was like, oh, wow, we probably need like 75, 90 minutes. So this will be a little bit rushed, but um, I'm hoping this is a topic folks are interested in and we can continue talking about it further. But the reason I got interested into it specifically for Postgres, well, I actually got interested in it a long time ago because um, like Sergey, I actually studied machine learning in college. So when I studied it, I was like, well, it's not going to be commoditized. It's too difficult. Everything's ad hoc. And, you know, it's one of the two things I kick myself about as much as I love Postgres. But it all comes down to this like funny little arrow thing called a vector. And a vector has some special properties. One of them is that it has a, well, it has a size, you call it a magnitude, or it's some, you know, some place in space. It has direction. It's actually something that's just generally very useful. We've been using it forever. So for example, like I found, uh, actually, believe it or not, this is a standard PowerPoint image. There's a map of Europe. And I decided to plot like, hey, where's, you know, where all the PGConf EUs have been through the years. And, you know, t here we are today in Athens. And, you know, what if I wanted to run a query that was like, you know, find me the three closest cities that we've had PGConf EU before to Athens. And it looks something like this. You know, we can do this in Postgres today. The astute observer would say, no, you should do that using po the PostGIS extension. But, you know, I wanted to write a quick example. And, you know, we can eyeball this and we would say like, okay, well, the three closest PGConf EUs are those locations. Now, to do that kind of search, you need to do something called a nearest neighbor search or a KNN search, which is something that is fairly common in machine learning, let alone other things like, you know, mapping. And normally to do this kind of search, you have to search through all the vectors in that space. But there actually are techniques that let you index it. And particularly for small little two-dimensional vectors, it's very fairly easy. You can use something called a KD tree. Where basically, when you build your index, you're just building like smaller and smaller and smaller boxes till you get to the area that your initial uh, your initial point is in, and you can start you know zooming out and finding all the different vectors that you have you know within that space. Postgres has been doing this for quite a long time. Uh, I believe I was Postgres 9.1 added support for uh, k-nearest neighbor searches through the gist index, so it's something that's not particularly new. And when you look at vector search in itself, you know, there's a few foundational elements and it comes to math. Actually, my, one, my, my favorite math class in college was real analysis, because for one thing, I finally understood calculus when I, when I did that class. But you define these things called metric spaces or vector spaces that have all these all these like important properties. And these properties become important, particularly when we come into the the, the database realm of trying to be able to do efficient searches, because unfortunately, we can't violate the laws of physics. We are going to violate the rules of SQL, as you will see, but you know, that is a much longer uh, discussion that I believe, I hope, uh, some committees are discussing. But if we understand these foundations, we can understand like, how it applies to this brave new world we're in with modern AI and machine learning algorithms. And you know, something like this, where you know, what we've seen over the past couple of years is I might come to something that you know, looks like a human. It's an AI assistant. I might ask a question about, you know, where can I find the best green olives near the PGCon VU Athens venue? And the AI agent will go up into some, you know, you know maybe, it's, maybe it's already trained itself on this entire data set about, you know, all the local stores in Athens. Or more likely than not, it needs to be able to query a database to be able to find the information about it. And there's this technique called retrieval augmented generation that's become quite popular to do this because these modern... AI and ML models need to train on vast quantities of data. You've probably heard that you need to get you know, a whole array of GPUs and all the information on the internet and train all that information. And for one thing, you know, that's very expensive. For another thing, it does take a lot of time. And if you need to be able to get information that's maybe in you know, your private database that has all the information about all the stores in Athens, and you query this foundation model, it's probably going to say, hey, look, I don't know, you know where I can buy these green olives in Athens. But if you're able to take the information that is in your database and apply that to the foundation model, so effectively like augmenting its information, hence the term uh, augmented, uh, retrieval augmented, you can be able to say like, oh, yeah, I know where to buy all the green olives. Here are the five closest places from you know, where you're looking at. And that's pretty cool. But this is where the vector comes in. 
And you know, I just want to spend a little bit of time setting up the problem because we're going to need a lot of time to talk about the implementation. But the vector is basically your mathematical representation of an object in the real world. So you know, we can have a vector for a clicker. We can have a vector for light. And those vectors are generated by the ML models. Uh, typically, in generative AI, they're called embedding models, where basically these models have been trained on so much information that when they see the word chandelier or they see a picture of a chandelier, they're able to generate a vector that you know that base that represents those objects. Then ultimately, you can compare them together. So I can say that okay, this you know chandelier is similar to the projector, but the chandelier might be different from the wall. And basically, it maps it in the space where objects that are more similar to each other are closer in that space, whereas objects that are less similar are much further away. Well, how does this relate to databases? Well. We want to be able to store the vectors in the databases in order to be able to rapidly look them up. That's the retrieve augmented generation step. And there's two parts to it. First, we take our source data, let's say pictures of chandeliers. We put them into the machine learning models, and it outputs the associated vector to it. And we store it in that database to be able to perform that similarity search. Then there's the, there's the agency step where you have your application. It could be an AI assistant. It could be a search system. You know you have the better imaginations than I do. And you have a user come in, they ask a question, you know, where, you know, what are, where do they, you know, where are these chandeliers uh, available for purchase? Uh, you put it into that embedding model, you perform the vector similarity search, and then, it, and then um, you might be able to use it to like augment the response using the foundation model, which uh, outputs like the, the rich text responses and you're off to the races. So it's very simple. It's a very powerful technique because suddenly you don't need to necessarily train your own foundation models to be able to get that you know, rich response. You're able, to, you're able to basically take your existing data and continuously augment the information and add more information to it. Now, this is a, you know, this is a database conference. This is a Postgres conference and it's a Postgres talk. So the reason you know, I wanted to set this up is you know, to sort of drive home the pain point, you know, this is why we're doing it. But to me, the fun part is actually searching over the data. And what's very interesting is that these foundation models do encapsulate so much more information, but they use very large vectors. These aren't like two dimensions or three dimensions. They're 700 dimensions, 1,500 dimensions, 3,000 dimensions. And each dimension is, you know, typically it's a four-byte a four floating point value. And you start doing the math, and that adds up. Uh, 1,500 dimensions is about six kilobytes. Uh, 3,000 dimensions is about 12 kilobytes, and that's going to matter uh, as we get through this talk. So the first thing is that it does take a lot of time to generate these vectors, in particular, because you take this image, and then you have to output this larger payload. But beyond that, as I said, they're large. And this adds up very quickly, because you know we might just stare at this and be like, okay, a million of these vectors is only 6 gigabytes, so what? You know, like This presentation, I think, might be 6 gigabytes worth of images. But... Think about it from a database perspective. Like in Postgres, like it took me years, like for like a highly, well, highly transactional system I had to reach like six gigabytes total storage. Because typically we're storing much smaller values, but these are very large vectors. And we think we might be able to compress them, but there are a bunch of random four byte floating point values. Like there's really no way to compress them. Fun fact, if you actually do try to compress them in Postgres, they'll come out larger because you just have your compression header and an uncompressed value. So then, you know, how do we actually query them? Well, in order to compare every single dimension, when we do what we call distance computation, which we'll talk a lot about in this presentation, we have to compare every single dimension in the vector. So as I like to say that, there's no shortcuts there. But some embedding models might let you shortcut and say, like, hey, if you compare the first 100 dimensions, that might be good enough. But like, that's really dependent on the embedding model you're using. So you have to assume that you have 1,500 dimensions you got to compare every single one times a million, like it's very expensive. And this has led into this wonderful field of approximate nearest neighbor search, which is, you know, in the scope of a mathematical sense is relatively new. I'd say, you know, the modern research where it started, you know, roughly like 25 years ago, at least now in the context of machine learning, even though we've been doing searches uh, across vectors for effectively since the dawn of the computing age. But... The idea with an A and N search is that you can find similar vectors without having to search across every single one of them. And that's important because if I only have to do, say, 
5,000 comparisons versus a million comparisons, that should be a much faster search, you know, 20x faster if I got my math correct, or 200x faster. But the challenge is that if you're not searching across the entire search space, you may not be seeing all the best candidate vectors to compare, to compare with. And that's going to be the tension that we deal with with all these systems. Now, when I do the best practices version of this talk, you know, this is effectively, you know, everything revolves around recall. Recall is a measurement of the expected number of results you're going to return. So if in an exact nearest neighbor search, I'm supposed to return these 10 vectors, but I only return eight of them in the search, then my recall is 80%. And recall is really the ultimate measurement of the quality of a, the system. Because I could say like, look, I'm getting like 10,000 queries per second, like high throughput vector search, but my recall is 20%. It's like, so what then? You know, you're basically only get you're, you're not getting good results. I was gonna use a New Yorker phrase for that, but. You know, I, I I stopped for a second, but this is why you know you always have to you you know measure everything against recall. Now this is going to be less of a measurement talk. We're going to show graphs and numbers, but you know you know the part of you know what we're looking at is as we go through and look at these different algorithms, we want to see how do we maximize our recall to performance ratio, and there's a lot that's going to be in tension here. So there's a few different classes of ANN algorithms. Uh, we're going to focus on two very heavily today. So there's hash-based, where basically you take your vector, you transform it into uh, you know, a special kind of hash, which kind of looks like a vector. And you're basically able to, you know, you're trying to basically do a, a fast enough approximation that you know, it's much faster than searching over all the different vectors in the space. There's tree-based, which we've already seen. You know, this is very popular in geospatial systems where Effectively, they continue to reduce the search space to get down to the area, you know, localized area to search in, and in theory, it should be a lot faster. The problem with both of these methods is that they typically break down with very large vectors. I actually tried using uh, the gist the gist framework within Postgres to on some of these larger vectors, and I, you know, again, it was like a weekend project. I tried to hack it real quickly, and like I couldn't even get like the index to complete building. Probably a bug in my code, but the you know the, the you know the challenge is that some of the traditional indexing methods don't work as well. But there's two that have become you know, fairly popular, both with in-memory approximate nearest neighbor search and uh, uh, database-based approximate nearest neighbor search, and they're clustering methods and graph methods. And that's where we're going to focus most of the talk today. Clustering methods, the idea of clusters is that you know your vector space in advance, and you're basically able to pick a few centers in it, or a few lists to use the, the parlance of the ANN implementers. Because the idea is that, well, let me search over you know, one or more of these centers, and more likely than not, the most similar vectors that I want to look at are in that space. It's very interesting what happens in practice there, which we'll explore. The graph, the idea is that you're basically building very small centers in a way that you know, every, every single vector in the index points to a neighborhood around them to be able to say, like, hey, these are my nearest neighbors. And the idea is that if we're able to develop an efficient traversal method, we can we can very quickly and very accurately get to our localized vector set, and again, what happens in practice will be you know, very interesting. Now, the thing is, like a lot of these indexes have been designed to work in memory, and my oversimplified uh, index layout in memory looks like this, where you have something in memory, it's all there, it's all in one place. Now, in practicality, it's not in all in one place in memory. But it's so fast to traverse memory that it arguably doesn't matter. Of course, it does matter, but I'm going to oversimplify it a little bit for this exercise. But with the database, it's a little bit different because you're basically putting everything in chunks. And again, it gets more complicated as you get to different parts of the stack, that your disk might be allocating things in certain chunks, and your operating system might be thinking about things in certain chunks. And your database might be thinking about things in certain chunks. And in Postgres, you know, this chunk is called the page, this eight kilobyte unit that is going to be both a very nice design constraint and also the bane of our existence in vector search. But this is very important because um, these chunks are, you know, these chunks are very important for a lot of reasons. For one, it's, you know, what gives Postgres a lot of its power. By knowing that you have an eight kilobyte unit to store, it unlocks uh, all the other features of Postgres, you know, effectively durability, um, you know, knowing exactly where your data is at a given time, efficient searches. But from, uh, you know, from a approximate nearest neighbor indexing standpoint, 
it means we have to think a little bit harder in terms of how we group things together. For example, like my layout in disk might look completely different than what my index actually looks like, or my layout in memory might be different as well. And because my index is across these eight kilobyte chunks, I need to spend time fetching possibly multiple ones. So it's not just like one single pull where all my information is there. I may have to be doing individual queries across that, across that page, or sorry, across that data. It gets even more fun. What happens if your index exceeds available memory? Well, I mean, that's okay, right? That's why we have a database. But it can start getting like a little bit challenging because of that. So for example, let's say I need to pull in um, you know, that 21 through 24 chunk. Well, okay, I need to evict some of the pages from memory and pull in other pages, but that's fine. But let's say I need to pull in another chunk. Okay, again, that might seem fine, right? This is how database works. But the thing with a lot of these index queries is we're going to see is that it's not, it doesn't necessarily follow the same pattern as the B tree query. So uh, for folks who attended Grant McAllister's talk yesterday, you know, a lot of what Grant talked about was you know, with bee trees, if you have a right-leaning tree, typically you're going to have your data hot in memory. But we're going to find that a lot of the approximate nearest neighbor search queries are effectively random. So if you're constantly pulling things in and out of memory, you're thrashing, which can ultimately have an impact on performance. And again, for, you know, from an in-memory implementation standpoint, that doesn't matter because you have everything in memory. But this definitely impacts the way we need to think in terms of how we group data, because in theory, if we can group more common data that we need on the same page, then it's going to reduce the amount of thrashing. But we're going to see that with these very large, these very large uh, vectors, it's going to be very hard. So here's where this divergence occurs. Uh, you know, we, we already talked about uh, memory allocation versus pages, but you know, additionally, you know, how your data is laid out on disk. You know, SSDs have kind of been the, the cheat code for databases for you know, the past couple of decades because in some ways it doesn't matter where it's laid out on disk. We can do the scans very quickly, you know, particularly sequential scans. But you know, with you know, the old style disk, you, know, you really want to know, you, know, you really want to group things together uh, that you needed to be able to you know, pull the data efficiently into memory. Um, the final point, because we addressed you know, a few of these before, is hardware acceleration, and that certain things that might make sense. You know, we hear that GPUs are very good at highly parallelized computations, you know, particularly on you know, vector data, matrix data, et cetera, but not necessarily for databases, because for a database, we need to be able to pull the data from, from storage into main memory, or from main memory into CPU memory, or main memory into GPU memory. And we actually need specialized hardware for that because otherwise the overhead is not going to make sense from a database standpoint. Uh, there's, you know, there's, uh, if you want to read more about that, the, the documentation for the open source HeteroDB project has been you know, tracking this field for years. And I could tell you all about the specialized hardware you need for that. But you know, this is where I like to say that you know, just like taking your data from your database and putting it into the GPU to speed up your computations may not uh, work the way that you expect. So here's some. So as we you know begin this journey to implement uh, approximate nearest neighbor search in Postgres, uh, here's a few design principles that we should you know keep in mind based upon all these constraints. So first, take shortcuts wherever possible. I almost wanted to say like cheat wherever possible, but I don't want to encourage cheating. But every single time we can get a a performance gain, we're going to take it. The other thing is that we have a design constraint that we need to design for these eight kilobyte pages or blocks within Postgres. And one of those constraints is going to be a very hard constraint. I mean, I think I'll just spoil it right now. While you have a way to resize your heap pages or your table pages in Postgres, the index pages are fixed at 8 kilobytes. So that is a hard constraint. And it may not be trivial to change that. But the nice thing is that we have Postgres. And I think the best feature of Postgres is that it's an extensible database. You know, the tagline for the project is, is that it's the world's most advanced open source relational database. But it's, I think it's most advanced because it's extensible, that if it doesn't have something, we could write an extension. We can use existing Postgres internals and APIs to be able to add things to it. And the more that we can do that, the more, you know, in many ways, the more robust we can make this implementation. But we need to understand our trade-offs as we go through it. This is both a best practice for actually using something like a PG vector but also with implementing as well, because we're going to have this constant tension between performance and recall and how much storage I'm taking up. 
And all these things, you have to make a design trade-off, not from just an implementation standpoint, but also from a usage, usage standpoint. So what is, who's familiar with PG Vector? Cool. For those of you who are not familiar with PG Vector, PG Vector is an extension that adds a vector data type to Postgres and all the capabilities we need to, to perform a modern vector search across very large vectors. I won't spend too much time on this slide because we're going to you know, dive very deep into a lot of these topics. But what I will show you is an example query. Uh, PG Vector, as you're going to see, implements two types of indexes today, uh, IVF flat and HNSW. And this is an example query uh, without a semicolon, so it wouldn't actually execute, uh, to be able to perform a approximate nearest neighbor search. It looks a lot like that, that geospatial query we had at the beginning. The only difference is that we're using a vector data type instead of a point. And, you know, it looks like, you know, otherwise it looks exactly like that. Here's, you know, find me my, my 10 you know, most similar documents to this vector. So I say that because, you know, this is, you know, it should feel very familiar if you're used to writing SQL. The one difference, or there's a couple differences. The key difference is that you have to use session parameters really to understand how to query the data. Uh, the, the session parameters here impact, ultimately impact your search quality and your search speed, you know, both, because they're both in tension. But the reason I throw that out there is, remember I said we're going to violate some rules of SQL? So if you're an SQL pur purist, your order by is actually, you know, you're supposed to return things in their true order. But we're actually approximating the order based upon when we use an approximate nearest neighbor index, that if we don't have 100% recall, we might not be returning everything in the order that we expect. That's okay, because you know, this, is the, you know, this is sort of what we are inheriting to be able to have vector search in Postgres, but it's something to keep in mind. And ultimately, when you hear k nearest neighbor, k is your limit in Postgres. So this is our, we're saying, okay, our limit is, is 10 here. But everything is going to revolve around effectively this query uh, as we go forward with our implementation. And as we implement things, you know, we need to define three things. First, a data type. We need a vector. There's actually some other kinds of vector types in PG Vector as well, which we probably won't have time to cover today. But uh, we're going to look at what it takes to implement a vector data type. We then need distance functions and operators, because our distance is going to tell us how similar are we to each other. Distance can be line of sight which is known as a Euclidean distance. It could be what's called a cosine distance, which is an angular distance. Uh, and there's a few other metrics as well, uh, the dot, you know, dot product being another one of them and some bitwise comparisons. And then finally, we need our indexing strategies, which will be you know, the bulk of the remainder of the talk. So excuse me, so first we need to implement a data type. And a vector data type is very straightforward. It's effectively uh, an array of a number of dimensions, and you got to store the number of dimensions that you need. But you see, like, this thing up top, like, v underscore lin underscore something. Like, what is that? Have folks seen that before? Yeah, so it's actually, this is actually interesting. This is part of leveraging Postgres infrastructure, which is, this is basically allows you to store variable amounts of information. This is known as the Toast infrastructure. And Toast is pretty cool. Who, who's familiar with Toast? Cool. So now you know how to implement a data type that is Toastable. Uh, Toast is very interesting with vector data, though, because the idea with Toast is that you can store, basically you can store information that goes beyond the page. Though so I just said that you can't do that for index pages, but we'll put that aside for a second. That being said, for regular table pages or heap pages, you're able to you're able to toast data, but it might not necessarily work the way that you think it does. So just real quick, these are the four different storage types available for uh, for toasting data. Uh, currently, PG Vector uses the external type by default, which is uh, store try to store the data in line, but if it exceeds the toast threshold, store it in your toast table. But don't try to compress it, because remember, we can't compress these random four-byte floating point values. You know, don't waste your time trying to do it. This does have ramifications, though. So plain, remember, so plain storage is when you're storing the vector in line with your table, you know, and external storage is storing your vector out of line. And in, a in the best practices talk, we show this actually does have some implications for how you access your data. And really, the main takeaway is that if your vector is in your hot path, like if this is the primary thing you're searching over in your table, 
store it plain if you can. If it exceeds, you know, the size of the page, you do have to store it, you know, as an external as an external type, but that's okay. But even though like even though we have these, you know, interesting, you know, toast gotchas, and again, full, you know, there's a much longer talk on that. We can't use toast for the index pages. And you know, this has become a little bit of a challenge because there are these embedding models that are that go beyond the page. But the thing from an internal standpoint is, you know, not only that, but how effective is it to store vectors within a, a database page? And to me, this is actually, I must want to say like the rest of the talk revolves around this slide in many ways, at least indirectly. But remember that we said in order to try to search efficiently over something in a database, we want to minimize the number of pages we have to read into memory. Well, eventually we get into a limit about that. You know, so if you take vectors that are 120 dimensions, that's actually very efficient because we can stuff a lot of them into a single page. So if we're able to build like a cluster of vectors that is effectively all in one page, like we can do like very, very fast searches, like pulling one page, you know, one Postgres page is super, super fast. But when we get to like, say, you know, some of these larger vectors, you know, in using some of the common embedding models, you know, 768 dimensions, 1500 dimensions, we're getting like only two or one vectors per page. And it's actually kind of wasteful because, like, you know, we basically have all this extra space we're not using, you know, and, you know, we're going to see this in particularly in the index, like that is going to be a huge waste. It's, I mean, I think my, my take is that it maybe does leave some performance on the table, but it's also just, you know, just more, you know, general storage that, you know, we can't, you know, particularly utilize. The table is less of a problem because the table, you know, we can, you know, add more data to the pages, but, you know, we have this issue in the index. To the point where that ultimately, if you have some very large vectors, it's actually an efficient use of space on our index pages. So that's, I don't know, I think that's like kind of cool. Oh, sorry, I forgot to like flip over like the wasteful part. Yeah, a thousand, a thousand dimensional vectors, Ugh, that, that kind of stinks. So we have a vector data type. Now we need some distance functions. So uh, there's all these different distance functions that Peachy Vector, or all these distance types we want to implement in Peachy Vector. They all have an operator. Uh, these operators are, I don't know if they're standard or not. These are the operators that there are. And effectively, in Postgres, when you define an operator, you have to tie it to a function. Uh, PG Vector does these in C for a lot of different reasons. And the key property here is immutable, because if they're immutable, we can use them in indexes. Immutable means that given, you know, given your, the same set of inputs, you'd always get the same outputs based upon those inputs. And we basically have to implement this for you know every single you know every single operator here. Additionally, if we added more vector data types, we have to make sure we have corresponding functions for the same operators. Now, just a couple of things I want to mention here. I'm going to go relatively quickly through these, but uh, important things to note if you decide to implement your own index. Uh, first off, there's a standard definition for how you implement functions in C that ultimately get mapped to uh, SQL level functions. It looks kind of like this. Um, there's, there's some other syntax here, but again, you know, we're trying to repurpose things that we already have in Postgres. Now, you're going to spend most of your time doing distance computations, just in general in vector search. So every single time we can take a shortcut here, we are. So the first shortcut is leveraging the compiler. Modern compilers are able to detect certain aspects of uh, you know, implemented functions and say, Oh hey, I can apply some hardware acceleration to it, such as using SIMD. You know, SIMD is you know a feature of uh, modern CPUs that lets you parallelize some of the functional operations. Which, when you're comparing 1500 dimensional vectors to each other, cool. Like you want to be able to accelerate that. It's even better if you don't have to implement it yourself, but sometimes you do have to. Um, the the almost well, we're about to have a new version of PG Vector, but. The current latest, soon to be previous version of PG Vector added explicit SIMD dispatching uh, to leverage AVX 512 instructions and Intel chips, which are particularly useful for uh, bitwise comparisons, which we see uh, when we get to uh, using uh, binary quantization or bit vectors. So again, you know, every time we can take a shortcut, you know, that's certainly good to do. But the biggest shortcut is actually algorithmic, and that's being able to build out indexes. And what's cool, like one really, really, really cool thing about Postgres is that it actually lets you define your own indexing methods in a variety of ways. Who's used any of these indexes on this page before? 
all of you, right? Because I'm sure you've all used bee trees. But what you may not know, and honestly, I didn't know until maybe like 18 months ago, was that you can basically define your own indexing strategies within some of these frameworks, you know, particularly GIST. And what's really cool about that is you can define not only your own indexing method, but it, it takes care of a lot of the things that you don't need to worry about in Postgres, like vacuum. Like you don't want to have to like build out your own vacuuming strategy. It's like hard enough for, you know, <laughs> to maintain like a really good index vacuuming strategy in, in Postgres itself. But that's really cool. So like, let's take GIST for example. Effectively, GIST exposes a functional interface where you can build your own API into it. And if you implement these functions, uh, or if you implement most of these functions, you don't have to implement all of them, you get your own indexing method. Again, we probably could do a whole talk just on how to implement a GIST index, but I want to throw that out there as a consideration because GIST does include something called the distance function for implementing KNN. But as mentioned, we're going to have to make a trade-off for PG Vector, which is we're going to have to build a custom index because the you know, IVF flat and HNSW, it's a little hard to fit them into the GIST framework. It might be a fun exercise to try, by the way. Now, Postgres lets you be able to define your own custom indexing methods using something called an index access method. Um, index AM you know, it is the slang term for it. And... Effectively, if you're able to define your index, you know, using you know particular definitions of it, and you know we'll go through some of this, uh, you can define any indexing method under the sun. So I remember when a uh, HNSW was implemented for PG vector, you know, a lot of people were saying like, you can't do this in Postgres. Like Postgres doesn't do graphs; it does trees. Well, first off, a graph is a specialized version of a tree. I mean, actually, a tree is a specialized version of a graph. Graph is a superset of that. But hey, if you could just define like how do you point to data on disk, you know, you can implement any kind of method. But as I mentioned, like there's more work to doing this. You know, while it does allow you to define your own indexing methods, you do have to define, you know, how do you write to the write ahead log? How do you handle vacuum? How do you handle planning? All these things that you might be able to take for granted. Actually, locking is a good example. Uh, there was a lot of work on PG Vector just to adapt it to uh, leverage some of the locking features in Postgres that actually helped speed it way up you know, from a query standpoint. So this is cool. Very powerful feature of Postgres. C can be very hard to get correct. But we're going to have to make this trade off because you know, we want to be able to optimize that recall performance ratio. So a few key methods. i am cover this really quickly for PG Vector. So as I mentioned, there's properties and functions you need to define. By the most important property for a PG vector is AM can't order by op. That basically says, all right, if you see something in your query that says order by like distance function, and they, you know, consider this uh, method for, for purposes of query planning. But we set AM can order to false because AM can order says like, oh, the data is totally ordered on disk, right? Except it's not for you know the case of PG vector because we're doing an approximate ordering. Uh, also, you know we enable parallel index builds, which uh, it, it is you know pretty important. So the other thing is that you have to define a whole list of these functions. And just real quick, these two are responsible for adding data to your index or building your index. This one's responsible for vacuum, uh, one of the more tricky ones to implement. This is responsible for determining your the cost estimate of your query, uh, which again that's that that ultimately tells Postgres like whether or not to choose that path uh, when you're trying to be able to query the data, and this define this defines how you actually scan your index. All these are very important. There's a few others as well, but like these make up you know the the brain of the index. So there's two indexing methods available in PG Vector today. There's IVF flat, which is that cluster-based method we talked about earlier. And there's HNSW, which is the graph-based the graph -based method. Now, just being cognizant of time, I'm going to speed through a couple of things here. But the, the most important is immediately upon indexing is that we, you know, we're going to take a shortcut, which is to store normalized vectors in the index. Why do we want to do that? Well, if you're able to meet the, the, the correct properties for being able to store a vector in an index, which are listed out below, Effectively, if we do a little bit of work up front, which is basically set every vector to have the same magnitude, we're going to be able to cut out operations when we're doing index searches. And that's very important because remember, every shortcut counts. As you see with normalization, uh, or let's take the, the vector cosine similarity function, like we have some expensive operations in here. We have like square roots and division. Division's a very costly operation. 
So if we're able to cut that out by storing our data pre-normalized, uh, you know, that makes it, that allows us to go much faster. So here's the shortcut. Because we know the magnitude's one, we don't need to do like the expensive division operation. We're basically doing a sum and a couple of multiplication operations. And again, that speeds things up. Um, and just to complete this, uh, we actually, you know, because of that, uh, there's a difference between cosine similarity and cosine distance. Cosine distance is the inverse of cosine similarity, but for purposes of comparison, we want to know how far we are from each other. So we have to take the negative inner product, but hey, that's better than doing a square root and a division exercise. So we're going to talk real quick, you know, how do we, you know, how do we build these, how do we actually implement these indexes within Peachy Vector? So first we need to know how do we build an IVF flat index? So this is our cluster-based method. So the first thing that we have to do is you actually need to have your data preloaded. Um, if you don't have your data already in your table, uh, you can actually build a cluster because you don't know where your data actually is. But the, the way we actually figure out how to build the cluster is we sample the data. And interestingly, you know, no matter the size of your data set, ultimately you'll sample about 10,000 vectors when you build your cluster. And we leverage uh, the Postgres Analyze uh, capabilities to do that. We then calculate our k-means. Uh, there's a parameter in uh, IVA flat called IVA flat list. That's going to tell you the number of centers that you have. And then from there, you're going to assign all the vectors in your table to a particular list. Uh, you, you do a sorting operation, right, which is you know, very fast. And then we're going to save the index to storage. It's actually a very simple method, you know, when you come to, you know, when you come to see it in this way. Uh, it does involve writing a lot of C, but, you know, the nice thing is that it's, you know, fairly straightforward. So, like, for example, with sampling, Let's say this is our entire data set. We'll sample a few of these vectors. And then let's say you know, we have three lists to, you know, we're building three lists or three centers. Uh, we'll, we basically try to find those centers you know, amongst the vectors that we sample. We then assign them. So we remember that means we take every single vector in the data set and then assign them to a particular center. Now, what's interesting is in the, the original implementation of this in PG vector, we were doing a sequential scan, which basically means we have one worker going to every single vector and then assigning it to a list. That was a very exhaustive method. Uh, in PG vector 05, we added parallelism, where you basically do a parallel scan and then assign all the vectors to the list. This had a huge impact on IVF flat index build time. Um, you could see the one worker and the eight worker on, on either side of it. And we can see that most of the time, you know, with one work was spent on the assignment. Once we did the parallel scan, most of the work was done on the, uh, well, actually it's equal between assignment and saving it to the disk. So we can see like, you know, that was a huge difference. And that matters because for all these methods, the more time you spend building your index and building a higher quality index, ultimately you'll have a better search experience. Now, one thing to note, excuse me, one thing to note with this is that with IVF flat, the disk layout does kind of matter because for a couple of reasons. First, the nice thing is that it's all, you know, because you're building everything up front, it's all going to be, you know, relatively ordered on disk. So all of your similar, all of your similar vectors in your list are going to be in the same portion of the disk, you know, relative to the index. Now, you might think to yourself, what happens if I add a new vector to the index, you know, after I build the index? Well, yeah, it's just going to be adding it to the end and it's going to be kind of fragmented in that way. But um, that's that's just the way it is. What's interesting, like this is going to be interesting when we start querying the index, because let's say you know the idea is that we want to be able to query the index you know as quickly as possible, and ideally we only want to be able to visit one center. But if we visit one center, we can see that maybe we're not necessarily getting the best results. Like it looks like there's a vector that's closer to that that blue vector, you know, at a different center. The other thing to keep in mind is that if you look at this from a disk scanning standpoint. Uh, well, there's a few things that we always have to do. We always have to, you know, query our root and then our centers, and then, you know, we'll find like the necessarily vectors we want to compare against and then compare against all those vectors. Why is this important? Because let's say we need to go visit two of the centers here. Well, in this case, we're going to get a better quality query, but look how much more data that we have to query in order to get that. Like we're going to, you know, this set of vectors and this set of vectors. And again, that could be okay based upon your recall target but it's going to impact your performance. And as you can see with IVF flat, like it kind of scales linearly. 
Now, the actual clustering, like it's not necessarily you're going to have even clusters when you build your clusters out. You know, we're, we're approximating here, but the general idea is that if you know if you want to be able to you know boost your recall, you are going to be ultimately scanning more and more of the data set you know, within a relatively even distribution. From an implementation standpoint, you know that's just the way it is. There, that's how the algorithm is defined, and there are definitely some uh, some things to consider in terms of other algorithms. Um, one thing is temporal locality. Uh, effectively, you don't have that uh, with IVF flap because if you if you're not querying the same portion of the index every single time, you have random queries coming in. You're just like randomly pulling data, you know, in and out of storage and memory. It's going latency is going to grow linearly, uh, and you know when you're getting outside of memory, if you have these very large indexes, like you know, lookups can become very expensive. Um, you know, we've seen this in practice as well. Additionally, you might have to do you know more maintenance because inserts and updates can skew lookups and uh, and query quality. But there's some opportunities here. Uh, Streaming I/O, which uh, Thomas Monroe, who I see in the audience, and I have been talking about, is a way that can help speed up, you know, doing the loads from disk if we can effectively parallelize some of the I/O. Um, and there's some other techniques as well. But the reason why we're going to just gloss through that real quick is we're going to talk about HNSW, which has really become the most popular method, not just in PG vector, but just across uh, database vector search in general. HNSW stands for Hierarchical Navigable Small Worlds, and effectively you're building microclusters, you know, as we mentioned earlier. The idea is that it's almost like a tree-based descent where you divide your worlds up into layers, the top layer being very sparse and the bottom layer containing everything or being very dense. The idea is that you quickly get through the top layers to get to the bottom layer, or you spend the most time of your search, but you've basically put yourself into the position where with high probability, you're finding the vectors that are the most similar to you. HNSW is all about the build. Like the more time you spend building this index, the better quality that you have. Though M is going to be the th M is the parameter. That's the number of bidirectional links, or basically the number of neighbors around you. That's actually the most important parameter in terms of the quality of the index. But it does have ramifications on query performance. Typically, it seems like M equals sixteen sixty four, which are the defaults, have been pretty good for for folks. I lately I had been recommending EF construction of 256. EF construction is like your short-term memory. Basically, as you scan through the index, the number of vectors that are, you know, your 256 neighbors or 64 closest neighbors. Um, we have actually seen some performance degrading on the query side when EF construction is higher. So I think it involves some more investigation. Again, EF search, it's the same thing as EF construction. Um, actually, in the paper, that it's just called EF, but you know, this is just to separate it, you know, from a usability standpoint. Uh, iterative search, we're not going to talk about today. That's a feature about to come out in PG Vector, but uh, it solves one of the biggest problems where if you don't return enough vectors to satisfy your limit, it'll keep scanning your HNSW index until it returns enough. Now, we're going to talk about how we query an HNSW index because the rest of this actually impacts the index build side. And the idea is that you start in the top layer. And you find your closest vector, you move down, you find your closest vector, you move down, you find, you, know, you find your best set of candidate vectors. But there's a couple things to note here. So first, uh, as you're going down, you're basically maintaining a list of vectors you visited because if you can avoid a vector comparison, you don't have to compare a vector again. So you have a visited list, which basically you use to throw things out. Within that, you maintain an ordered list of candidates you know, in terms of the ones that are the closest vectors that you've seen. This actually uses an internal Postgres structure called a pairing heap, which is very efficient at that. The other thing is that each layer, uh, you basically limit your search radius. So this is you automatically are doing EF search equals one until you get to the bottom layer when you use whatever EF search the user gave you, which will effectively give you a larger radius because you're not likely using an EF search of one. Now, again, this is important because the way that we search through an index is exactly how we build an index. So when we build an index, let's say you know, we have a bunch of vectors already in our database. The nice thing about HSW, first off, is that you could build it iteratively. So you don't need all the data there in place, though it can help on initial index build. But as you go through each layer, you basically determine you know, which, you know, first off, what's your entry layer, which we'll talk about in a second. But you use that to basically position yourself you know, appropriately in layer zero and build out you know, the appropriate number of bidirectional links. So briefly, uh, you have to determine your entry layer, because not all vectors go in the top layer or even the middle layers. 
And effectively, your entry la layer is determined by this function. You know, this is from the HNSW paper. Um, there's an, we have to determine our insertion method. Ideally, you're able to build everything in memory. That's much faster. Otherwise, you build it on disk, or effectively, you're moving things in and out of memory. You find your similar neighbors, you know, as mentioned. Uh, you add your vector to your graph, and then you update. You know, whenever you add a new vector, you have to actually update all the neighbors around the vector that you add, which is why an HNSW build can be a little bit more costly because you, you, know, you have to repair your graph around you. And you know, let's say if your M is 64, so that's 128 links, so you're impacting 128 other neighbors. One of the most interesting things is actually the entry-level distribution, because remember, most of your time is going to be spent in layer zero uh, as you finalize the search. And this is why like 16 is kind of like a magic number, because if your M is too small, um, you're probably not positioning yourself in like the correct area of the search. But if your M is very large, you know, while you're highly likely in the area you need to be, uh, you know, there's potentially there's potentially more data that you need to sift through. So, and if there's more data you need to sift through, that means you're pulling more data in and out of memory. You know, when you're searching layer zero, so like everything has a trade-off here. There's also like an impact to index build time and search quality. Uh, and you know, the way I would say that is like, as you see, like M, as you increase your M, you know, by eight, you're kind of like not doubling search time because um, I'm using parallel builds here. And you ultimately get diminishing return on your recall while you know paying a penalty of you know building the index. So you know the the way that we see that is actually with um, what's going to play into query costing, which is you know arguably the most important bit of this, is that your M is going to impact the total number of tuples scanned. So more tuples scanned means you're more likely to get a better quality result, but it also means you're going to have a slower query. And the other interesting thing is that the size of your data set, while it impacts it, it doesn't impact it as much as you can like look across here. Like you're actually kind of similar. Your embedding model, though, does impact how quickly you're able to basically converge and you know, complete your result. And that's really interesting because if you have an embedding model that like clusters similar things together, you're more likely to complete the scan more quickly, even if it's a much larger data set than something else. Uh, we don't fully account for that in the our uh, cost estimation for an HNSW scan, but you know, you'll see a note in a second. And again, just to show like you know different values of M, the left hand side is M equals 16, the right hand side is M equals 64 on each of them. Like M is the biggest you know factor in terms of how many uh, tuples are scanned. So real quick, uh, you know we actually uh, before PG Vector 08, uh, the HNSW estimation was way too low. In fact, we're, we're using the HNSW index way too frequently. So we updated it. And you know, as you can see here, you know, we basically called out like, hey, M is going to impact this the most, but you know, so do some other things as well. And we actually came to like quite a nice formula, which is effectively, we know that like from your from your entry level down to layer one, you're effectively doing like a small little search. So you're searching over your M or your number of bidirectional links, but then most of the times we spend in layer zero. And you know, there's some variables that are able to deal with that. Uh, the HSW scaling factor is effectively the uh, cheat code for the uh, embedding model because the embedding model is gonna really impact how quickly you converge. Uh, I still think it should be a configurable par parameter, but uh, we'll see. All right, we are right at time. Wow. So I'm going to jump ahead. As you see, this is the first time I'm doing this. A couple of quick things. So vacuuming. Um, vacuuming was probably the hardest thing to implement in HNSW because HNSW actually doesn't support a notion of deletion. So the PG, what PG vector does is that when you, you know, delete a vector, you first hide it, and then you repair the graph, similar to how we describe you know, the particular scan. So a couple of things, a couple of real quick things with HNSW. So the embedding model has a huge impact on overall time, which is what we try, what I tried really hard to convey. And I think there's still some opportunities to 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 make it better, including you know leveraging some of the newer upstream Postgres features. But parallel vacuum is probably something we want to be able to look at, or at least make it easier to implement. Because if you're heavily updating your HNSW graph, you know that can you know that can have an impact or a significant impact on uh, available resources. All right. Uh, I'll briefly talk on quantization very, very briefly because it's actually an interesting topic. So quantization is the ability to 
fit more data within a single page. So take you know binary quantization, the most extreme form, where we take a 32-byte floating point value and make it into a single bit. Um, this also overcomes some of the 8 kilobyte page limits. Uh, the way that's implemented is actually just functions. Postgres has this ability to take a data, you know, if you have an immutable function, you can take your input value and transform it into a different type. So this is scalar quantization. And this is binary quantization, where binary quantization, you need to make sure you do a re-ranking because you're definitely not getting results back in order. There's some pretty cool trade-offs with it. You know, you can see that, you know, using the more extreme form, you can store a lot less data in your index. And takes, you know, it's a lot faster to build, but you impact recall. Because see, the binary quantization one, look how fast it is. It's like 33,000 queries per second. Yeah, but it's only 80% recall, whereas the others you're getting about 93% recall. Now, again, you can tune your search parameter, EF search, to be able to boost that recall. And while, you know, at the same level of uh, EF search, uh, binary quantization model is still lower in recall, maybe 96% recall is acceptable for you. And you're able to basically get not only storage savings, but performance boost. Ongoing work. Probably the biggest area of research is the multi-column index. Um, we didn't talk about filtering today, but filtering is the hottest topic. I think PG Vector 8 is going to do a lot to help with that, you know, particularly with having the updated cost estimation. PG Vector will likely pick a different index, like a B tree, to be able to do a filter, which actually is the better case if you use the B tree because you'll get 100% recall and likely an equally fast search. Uh, there's a lot more to do. I think, you know, as we see, you know, different uh, database driven algorithms, maybe they make it into PG vector, maybe not. Um, happy to talk about the different options out there. But, you know, at the end of the day, uh, at least what I wanted to try to rapidly introduce in this talk is that, uh, first off, what works in memory might not necessarily work for a disk based system. And it seems like I think with HNSW, we've done a pretty good job adapting it to PG vector. Like the performance numbers are very competitive. Uh, but the really cool thing, you know, I really want the takeaway to be that Postgres is so cool because it's extensible. Like, we didn't have vector search, or we ha did have vector search starting in 2021 with PG Vector for like these very large vectors. And Postgres is like being used like very heavily. Like, I talked to folks who have like billions of vectors in a single Postgres database that are gigantic. Like, that's really cool. So it's rapidly evolving. And again, I'm happy to talk pretty much for the rest of the conference about this topic. So thank you. And thank you for bearing with me for going over by a couple of minutes. Any questions? If I do, do one question again, you can just grab me. I'll be around. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, very simple question. Have you experimented with uh, enlarging the block size? So I can't, I can't hear you. Have you en uh, experimented with enlarging the page size of Postgres? Yeah, experimenting a page size. So the experiment I've seen with page size has been around sequential scans because we can't we can't increase the page size on the index scans. But what's interesting is that when we did increase the page size for sequential scans, and again, limited test, you know, I won't go through all the different conditions in it, we saw like a significant increase in ingestion time or being able to load the vectors, particularly through the, the copy protocol, which kind of made sense when I ran it past some of the, the folks who actually know how Postgres works. Um, because it wasn't just like a linear increase, it was like a super linear increase in that. Um, theoretically, uh, it should also, you know, it should also help improve query times overall from like lighter tests we've done. But again, we only saw this on sequential scans. We didn't, I, I, in theory, it could work better for index scans because you can cluster more similar vectors on the same page. Thomas, okay, one more question. Is variable page size something that? Uh, I am personally interested in it, yes, because I think the, so the question, so, so variable page size would be, can you time, well, hopefully it's like dynamically set the page size, you know, as you go. Um, it would definitely be interesting because, you know, again, I think the, the more data you're able to fit on a single page, uh, the easier you're able to search over. If I know like, hey, I have to go to disk, but I only need to like load one page, I think it would help, but we'd have to run the benchmark because maybe streaming IO like negates the need for that in Postgres. Like, I, I think that's the open question. Anyway, I think I ran late, so I'm sorry. Happy to take more questions after. Thank you.